Foundation Trust. They all have such long names these days. Um, she's a peer worker and expert by experience with the North London Mental Health Partnership. Um, Selena uses both her personal lived and lived experience as well as her professional skills um, to support others. Um, and she's seen the immense value in that. Dialogue itself is an outcome scale to assess a service user's quality of life and the experience of the care they're receiving. Dialogue Plus can help with conversations between service users and their clinicians by focusing on the lowest scoring areas. Selena's um, been delivering training to staff and more recently to voluntary sector colleagues. And I'm really, really pleased that we've got here today to talk to us about this really, really important piece of work. So over to you now, Selena. Thank you very much, Donna. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I obviously can't see everyone, but I'm sure you're out there in the ether. So good morning um, to everyone. So we're going to start off by just a, a few slides just to give an overview of Dialogue Plus and then watch a video which, which we share with service users and carers, which kind of goes into more detail about what Dialogue Plus is. Just to say, when the video was made, we um, there was 11 areas of somebody's life, but that has increased to 13. And I'll explain a bit more as we do these slides moving forward. So, um, so as Donna um, beautifully said, my name is Selena um, and I have lived experience of using mental health services. So my diagnosis is schizophrenia and I was diagnosed in my mid thirties um, after um, self-medicating for many, many years before I was admitted into hospital. I had five hospital admissions um, and after uh, I came out of my fifth one, I said I didn't want to return. So I kind of looked at how I can move forward and I was very lucky because in those days there wasn't things like Dialogue Plus or the recovery star or the other tools that we have come to know. Um, but I came across two people who were who saw my strength, so who saw the things that I was good at and kind of made me focus on the things that I could achieve rather than the things that I wasn't doing so well at. Um, and then I went into peer work. Uh, my first job was with the NHS and, and it was with Barney Enfield and Haringey. Um, but I've moved along, I've moved from different trusts within London, working in different lived experience roles. Um, and I came back to Barney Enfield and Haringey as a peer lived experience manager. Um, and then I am now doing the role delivering Dialogue Plus, which is our new care planning tool um, across um, the partnership, which includes Barnet, Enfield and Haringey in Camden and Islington. Um, so, and and in between all of that, I trained as a social worker. Sorry, I always leave that. I, I feel more proud about my lived experience than I do actually about being a social worker, but I'm also a social worker. Okay, so Diablog Plus is a full therapeutic intervention. So it incorporates the dialogue scale but it goes beyond just a scale and now the reason for this is because it's um based around a four-step approach um, and it's about the relational conversations that you have with your key worker um, so the scale system is just to see where you are today and then the conversations that you have is about where you'd like to be you know, in the next week, next month, the next year. Um, and it's setting yourselves goals and actions that are reasonable and achievable based on your strengths. Um, it, it was developed by, Dialogue Plus was developed originally by Queen Mary University. Um, and then it was um, picked up by NHS England um, to for a three-year study with East London Foundation Trust to see if it would work within community mental health services. Um, there's a lot of the research has been published now, so you can gather more data from the research online. Um, 
And then NHS England decided that the feedback from the tool, especially from service users and carers, was so overwhelmingly positive that they said that they would um, now use Dialogue Plus nationally, replacing what we used to call CPAs, the Care Pay Program Approach, Care Planning Tool which a lot of service users and carers felt was a tick box exercise and a lot of it was copy and pasting. A lot of it was not co-produced care plans and service users felt their voices were not heard within their care plans. Things were written about them that they weren't aware of or they didn't want to be disclosed to others. So this is a national directive. So all trusts across England will be, um, have taken or are going to take on Dialogue Plus as their new care plan. Um, and the key questions when you start a Dialogue Plus um, with a service, when the service user starts a Dialogue Plus with their key worker is um, these questions. What recovery means to me what matters to me, my skills, strengths and experiences that will help me achieve my goal has to be completed in the first person. So the service user and also it's led, the care plan is led by the service user. Um, so it's not um, led by the key worker. Um, the scale is from one to seven. So one being totally dissatisfied and seven being totally satisfied. And there are 13 areas of someone's life, and some of these will include um, mental health, physical health, friendships, relationships, accommodation, personal safety, alcohol and substance um, use, um, finances. And there is a few others that I always forget, but there are 13 areas. And somebody's asked, asked on the day, where they are in regards to each of those areas. Whichever area scores three and below, those are the areas that the service user and the key worker will focus on first, um, because those are the ones that are the prioritized. Um, and the service user chooses which area they'd like to pick or which one is the most important for them to pick in that moment. The four step approach looks like this. So the first approach that is used is understanding. So it's about understanding what is happening for yourself and the key worker to understand what is happening for the service user at that moment. Um, also what has worked previously. So what things have supported the service user um, in the past. Um, looking forward, so it's about thinking about what is possible, um, what would they like to happen? Um, like I said, for some people, it's a day, for some people, it's a week, for some people, it can be months. Um, uh, so it's looking forward. And then the third um, stage is exploring options. So this isn't about coming directly with solutions. So at the moment, key workers are always quick to say, oh, we can refer you to A, B, C, and D, or we can do this, or we can do that. But actually there's a discussion about exploring what options are available and for the service user to choose which options are best suited for them. Um, and exploring options isn't just the responsibility of the key worker, but it's also the responsibility of the service user and their network. So they could ha maybe have an active person who supports them with care, or they could have a friendship circle that supports them um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's it's whoever's in the service users network that they want to be involved in, in supporting them. Um, and the last, uh, last one is a green actions. So this is really key, which was very different from the um, old model of care plans is that you agree goals together so that both of you are aware, the key worker and the service user of what goals are being agreed. 
and then you both agree on what actions. So who is responsible responsible for which acts action? When is it when is it going to be done? Um, so a timeline to when it may be completed, whether that's by the next visit, whether that's by a specific date. So that is that is the most crucial one for me, is because a lot of the time um, in the past things were agreed. But because we've had such a huge turnover of staff and just in general through the NHS, there's lots of changes happening. You agree um, something with someone, but by the time the next time appointment comes around, the person, your key worker has changed and that person isn't aware of what has been agreed previously. So by agreeing actions, there's a clear um, instruction that's left. So whoever comes um, the service user doesn't have to repeat the story they can just pick up from where they have left off so for me that's that's one of the keys and that is really important as well because we've had a lot of service users feedback especially from the traveling community and the homeless community where they move around a lot especially um, outside cities or even complete different areas and what they found with Dialogue Plus is that they can do one in London. And if they were to move, say, to Birmingham, they can just pick up their story from where they left off rather than repeating the whole history again to a new service in Birmingham. The skills we ask our key workers to focus on using are things like their coaching skills, their active listening skills, motivational interviewing skills, and asking open questions so that that encourages a conversation and encourage a discussion and focusing on individual strengths. So what someone is able to do rather than what somebody isn't able to do. Um, and one of the new ones which we are just inventing at the moment is the trauma informed principles um, because uh, in Barney, Enfield and Haringey. Haringey especially is, has quite a diverse area. So it's really important to be aware, have a cultural awareness of the service user that you're um, meeting. Um, and also elements around safety and empowerment, which informs trauma-informed principles. So at the moment, we're embedding those principles as well within Dialogue Plus. Um, if you have any questions about Dialogue Plus, um, my email address, the email address is there, but um, I'm sure uh, that that will be shared um, as well later. So what we're going to do is I'm going to stop sharing this and then I'm going to show the video. Uh, this I've got to say the silence is a bit disconcerting, but I understand why the silence is there. So. Don't get me wrong. Um, um, I think there's a question from Francesco, but um, perhaps it can be answered after the video, if that's okay. Yep. Uh, Francesco, we'll come to you after the video, um, but glad to, glad to see your hand raised. <laughs> There are some surveys that we fill in, which don't really mean anything at all. And within a care setting, there can be a lot of fault. Feel we need to get out of the way before the real treatment can start. Dialogue is different. It's a survey designed to measure how you rate your quality of life and your experience of the care you receive. Your responses can help structure a conversation with your healthcare professional about which areas are important to you, putting you at the center of the conversation. The dialogue form is very simple and it only has 11 questions. The first eight questions cover different areas of your life. And the last three are about your treatment. You don't need to write out long responses or give too much detail. Just choose a number from one to seven that best matches how you feel, with one being totally dissatisfied 
and seven being totally satisfied. Dialogue is a personal measure. Two people giving the same number for the same question might mean two very different things. There are no wrong answers, so just try to be as honest as you can. By filling in your answers at the beginning of your care, you can get a really good idea of where you are starting from in terms of quality of life. Filling them in again sometime later, either during or at the end of your treatment, can be a useful record of where you're making progress and how well your treatment is working for you. Any positive change is an achievement and can give you confidence, but we don't expect to see constant improvements all the time. If there isn't a lot of change or your ratings get lower, we might use this as a starting point to discuss making some changes to your treatment. Whatever happens, carrying out dialogue a number of times helps to build up a picture of your care which highlights areas that are meaningful and important to you and can be a very useful tool to help you understand the parts of your life where you need the most help and how well the help you're already getting is working. Dialogue Plus is a way of taking things one step further, using the ratings you've given as a guide for you and your clinicians to explore and address your identified problems and wishes. It's an approach which emphasizes supporting you to inform your own care planning, find solutions and solve problems. By measuring quality of life and quality of care over time, you and your clinician can work together towards making a meaningful and lasting difference to your well-being. And remember, you can ask your clinicians about how you can use dialogue as part of your care at any time. Um, so thank you. Just before we have um, questions, just two key... Wix is your platform oh. for Formod. A complete portfolio solution means you Sorry, that would teach me. I thought I was, everything was going so well there. Um, so just two two key points I just want to say that we started off with 11 areas of some quality of somebody's life within 11 areas, but we've increased that because Camden and Islington were using 13. So that was finances and drugs and alcohol. So now there's 13 areas within um, the Dialogue Plus quality of life scale. Um, and the other thing is, um, is one of the things that was raised by service users and carers is was accessing services. So not only accessing when you first access them, the challenges that, that were faced, but also about if you left a service about being able to come back to a service and so what dialogue plus has done is that there it's a, a basically there is nobody gets told no so every referral we receive a dialogue plus is completed and depending on the needs after the assessment that determines the care that the service user requires so that could mean that it's not necessarily for a mental health service, secondary service. It could be they could be supported within primary care settings or by one of our partners, which is in the voluntary sector. Um, so nobody gets told no now. So it's meant to make it easier for people to access services, but also that some people that leave services for them to be able to re-enter services if they need to. So that. That's me. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much for that, Selena, both for explaining that 
to playing dialogue plus to us, but also for sharing both your professional and personal experience. It's so powerful, I think, when those two things come together in one person and it's kind of absolutely transformational, not just for the individual, but for the people that you're working with as well. Um, Francesco has been very patient. He put his question in the box ages ago and he's got his hand up. So I'm going to call Francesco now to ask the first question. Yeah, that, that one can just stay in the chat. The first question that I would ask, given that we've got both functional mental health and organic mental health, um, I'm hoping that uh, mild cognitive impairment and dementia is not an area of exclusion for Dialogue Plus, but I understand that if patients with such a diagnosis don't have, you know, uh, family members, supporter, carers with lasting power of attorney that can support them, then you guys have to ask actors' best interest assessors because don't, as a Royal College of Psychiatrists quality assurer when I go into inpatient units, you know, one thing I find, this is going down to advocacy, is that the world has changed. You know, before COVID, I used to meet the independent mental health advocate, the independent mental capacity advocate, but I've never met an independent care advocate. Hey, that would get there eventually. But what I don't see is these people on the wards. Now it's all on the phone. Hey, a lot of older people that lack capacity don't necessarily remember or know. But having stage one, Alzheimer's, or stage two, doesn't stay free, doesn't mean to say that the person's incapacitated or they don't understand. It's just that they just need more support. So the question is, can uh, Dialogue Plus 11 or 13 be adapted in such a way to support a patient with with a mild cognitive impairment. Thank you. Selena, um, do you want to go answering that? Yes. So this is my understanding of all the documentation that anyone with a mild um, uh, cognitive um, <laughs> impairment um, still can take part in a Dialogue Plus and have one, have a Dialogue Plus assessment. Those that have been um, diagnosed as severe, um, they're not, they, they don't need to have a Dialogue Plus assessment. Um, so that's the understanding from NHS England is that those that have got severe, they're not, um, they're not to take part in having a Dialogue Plus assessment. And in older people's services, there is a separate piece of work being undertaken um, around Dialogue Plus and people with severe um, uh, cognitive impairment. But yes, anyone that is able to, in that moment, they can actually access Dialogue Plus and all services are using Dialogue Plus apart from forensic services, even though they will do, but at the moment there's some legal um, uh, barriers that we need to incorporate into Dialogue Plus, and that is being undertaken at the moment. So the teams that are using Dialogue Plus is inpatients, um, eating disorders, all community services, um, and older people's services, um, primary care, um, teams um so yeah so if i've missed anyone out i'm sorry but no no, no basically so, everyone everyone is using it no just uh, just can i just throw this in because everyone is in a flux of transformation i was down at um northwich park hospital last week doing an accreditation on one of the wards there and that and when you look at the criteria for you know, you have to be in the later stages of a diagnosis of dementia. Don't forget, for a lot of people, they end up getting diagnosed with either depression or delirium before dementia because they're all consultant that's trained in psychiatry, but not neurology, rather than have dual specialism as they do in America. So a lot of diagnoses may come a little bit late and people have progressed across the stages, unfortunately. So we talk about early detection and prevention, but if that ain't happening on your manner, you know, through the memory clinic and other services, then it just gets more complicated. But hey, each ICB are doing their own thing. Mine in Bristol, uh, they're talking about using what uh, 
what a joke, gay. Eh? They really need to speak to you, Celia, about using the friends and family test as a patient experience measure. Hello, wake up. I told them, no, it can't be. It has to be prom or prem. And for the clinicians, proms. Mm -hmm. What do you reckon? I can't imagine. Bit... Sorry. Yeah. No, no, sorry, Francesca. That's exactly what we're saying. So Dialogue Plus is the prom and prem. And um the honus is the crom so yes we are that is what we're using for outcome measures um and so hopefully the more each trust takes it on and because each trust is a different part of their journey so as, as soon as everybody is kind of hit a baseline in their journey the hope is that everyone will be singing from the same page thank, so thank you. you thank you Right, that was really interesting. Have we got any other questions or comments at this point? I can't see any hands up and there's nothing in the chat box. Oh, Simon Clark's got his hand up, Simon. Oh, hi there. Um, I'm the manager for community mental health team and we use dialogue in our team and in our organisation. Um, what we're starting to find is we, we are following instructions of our organisation that, that people are allowed to decline to complete a dialogue plus. They have a choice. However, we will then write the care plan for them and send it to them and now I'm starting to field complaints for people saying thank you I told you I did I'm saying this in polite terms it hasn't always been put this politely thank you I've I've said I didn't want to do it so why are you doing it for me and why are you then kind of adding insult to injury by sending this to me I mean certainly it's raised from our staff that we don't feel it's entirely ethical to to do it in the format we're filling in boxes that start with I um and we're not it, this is supposed to be about our patients, our service users, families, clients, all being at the centre of, of care, which is, is quite right. However, we are only respecting their views when they go along with what we want, um, which is basically you have to comply with filling this in and you're not allowed not to choose it. I don't think there needs to be an alternative uh, um, of some kind of clinician comment where appropriate, but I'm wondering what the views are of of this that we're saying you have a choice and then we're saying well we've done it for you and here's your choice doesn't quite seem to fit well with a lot of people staff and, and our patients Simon I mean thank you for the question it is a very thought-provoking question um so there are so my head is telling me one thing and my heart is telling me another so my head is saying is that this this is a service users care plan so if they have got the um capacity to make that judgment about not to do a dialogue plus then it should be declined and we should respect that that decision but it doesn't mean that every meeting you at every point of contact you have with the service user you don't revisit dialogue plus with them and see if their thought changes. Um, we shouldn't be completing it for them if they've declined um, and then sending them a copy. I can understand, that's where my heart was saying, I can understand why people are saying to you that, you know, if I've said I don't want one, then why are you sending me one? Because actually it won't, it, it has no meaning for the service user if it's completed by a clinician. So that's number two. And number three, I think we are always going to get a group of people. And actually, let me rephrase that. So this is a new tool, not only for us as key workers, but actually for service users and carers, it's a new tool too. So part of my role uh, originally was to train staff um, in Dialogue Plus and use a lived experience perspective to actually um, show the meaning behind when one is done well, what that can achieve. But the other part that I took the responsibility for was that going out into the community and talking to service users and carers about Dialogue Plus, the pros and cons of it, the things that they would benefit from completing one, and if they were to receive one, this is the kind of information that they'll be asked and I think the question would be, for me, would be about awareness, about how much work has been done around awareness about Dialogue Plus to service users and carers. 
and also to have some patience like I said that this is a new tool and for some service users being asked questions in such a structured way can be difficult um and so you may need to revisit it with them more than once I'm not sure if that's helped you I think I think it's um yeah no I appreciate your your comments I mean maybe I could clarify a little I think that would work for a certain proportion of our of our service users but as a community hub we have quite a wide variety of clinical pathways some of them are talking therapies only for example it's not and and people that we wouldn't classify with illnesses like schizophrenia or or um bipolar kind of you know so, so they are complex but not always the smi kind of category so there's plenty of people that are in a talking therapy that are perfectly able to make the choice and we wouldn't necessarily be asking them repeatedly so that's probably about 200 odd patients under our, under our care which is quite a large proportion and that's the cohort particularly that we're finding saying thank you but no thank you i'm having my therapy i don't need to go into everything else i just came to you for for that so it's it's a conversation I'm trying to have locally to see what how we can respond because um, it does feel like we are saying one thing but not really respecting yeah people's views and and you know if I was asked and I said no I think that should be understood I I think maybe coming back later saying would you reconsider fine but I think we should also be if we are genuinely putting people at the centre of their care we need to respect the views they have even if it doesn't fit in with our organisational targets. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that clarification, Simon. I mean, the only thing I would say is that Dialogue Plus isn't led by diagnosis. So it diagnosis it doesn't matter at the stage of doing a Dialogue Plus assessment. It's just the needs that come from that is then determines everything else. I think similar conversations we've had with psych our psychology teams as well that deliver talking therapies as well and really it's it's just it, dialogue plus is a tool so it's not it's not the all singing all dancing tool but it's a tool that is there to support a service user through their journey they may receive only one type of intervention or um or a limited time um framed intervention but I think just putting the in, constantly putting the information out there and just encouraging people to um, look at it is is all we can do. And if service users take it up, then that's great. The carers can support them. So maybe sharing the inform information. So yeah, I mean, I, I usually I offer when I get requests like this, I usually go into an organisation and kind of see how we can support the organisation and the service users using that organisation. But obviously, I'm not sure where you are, and I'm sure it may be out of my remit. Um, but uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, I can see Francesco's got his hand up again, but can I just check first, does anybody else either want to ask a question or put a question in the chat box and have me read it out if you'd rather not say your own question? Um, but in the meantime, while I'm waiting for everyone to decide that, um, Francesco, did you want to come back in? Thank you, Donna. I was just about to say that, you know, I'm, I'm fond of the sound of my own voice, so I don't mind talking, actually, and I'll take other people's <laughs> turns if they don't want to question. Yeah, um, what I was going to ask is that um, on inpatient wards, OK, each patient will have a ward round some or a review. Some of them use it differently. During COVID, most of it was um, uh, virtual because of that distancing, etc. Difficulty is, you see, going back to what Simon was saying, the one thing that I do, because what, what I do with the Royal College of Psychiatry is to actually make improvements suggests improvements and one thing that we always do because I lead on the interviews with carers and patients is around shared decision making preferences and wishes which is what dialogue plus 11 and 13 uh, works towards and 
the, the thing about having a, a key worker or a primary care nurse within inpatient setting is that, you know, there's a conversation that takes place before each review. Now, if you've only got a 0 0.5 full-time equivalent consultant psychiatrist as a responsible clinician for a 20-bedded ward, and bearing in mind that will only be about five PA sessions, then how the hell do they fit in all the ward rounds, you know, and allow for a half hour so that you got the other, um, you know, uh, multidisciplinary team members there, like the ph pharmacists and others and that. So I think in some ways, uh, you know, if it's kind of like sets uh, the parameters, you know, how that conversation, supportive conversation should be actually undertaken, then it, you know, we always recommend that there shouldn't be anything less than 0 0.5 full time equivalent for a 20 bedded ward. And that is a recommendation from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. It should never be over 20, but in places like Cumbria, Northumberland, where you're vast and remote, yeah, you know, big is beautiful. So 26, 27, 28 is quite normal. And I've come across quite a few. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like just thinking how can uh, can dialogue plus in terms of you know how it should be implemented correctly act as intellectual you know intellectual property in a funny kind of way to ensure that all the other 53 or however many outside of your partnership mental health trust provides a standardization and it, it doesn't deviate for local interpretation is that possible thank you Francesco, that is a very interesting question. Um, and I would just say from my own experience of accessing services in different parts of the country, um, that it would be a challenge to standardise inpatient care, partly because local needs are very different in each area. And also the local support services are very different in each area. Um, so a standardised way of working is, will, is a challenge. What we do say is that there is no right or wrong way if you follow the four steps. So whether you're in inpatients or in community, it's about having that one-to-one -one with your key worker to actually sit down and think about your needs and to complete a dialogue plus. Um, and, and what I suggest, because even if you take away a setting in our own lives, we do think about our needs and what do we need for today? Like, um, you know, what do I need to go to buy shopping, to go and eat dinner? So we do think about our needs, but we don't document those needs. So this is just a way because somebody's in our care, we're having to document the needs. Um, so sometimes when I've explained it that way to service users and carers, it seems like a lot less tick box for the benefit of the trust and more of a benefit for the service user and carer to actually do it and then they and then they are encouraged to use their language so the way that they would express themselves when completing dialogue plus which helps with taking ownership but as your question i i think standardizing care would be a challenge uh, fair enough i uh, just to say i agree with what you're saying uh, my experience of that occupational therapist assessments of activities of daily living you know when I look at dialogue plus and some of those domains that there's a lot of similarities and uh, certainly when I was assessed after being in intensive care unit after a cardiac arrest and that if I can make two cups of coffee, one with five milk, one with milk, one with sugar, the other one was saccharine, I couldn't remember, then they would make an assumption that I needed more time so that they could sort of like rehabilitate me. So, you know, in all fairness, there's there's a lot of good things that are coming through. And I would hope that, you know, patience is the preferred term for the Royal College of Psychiatrists, 
for the past four years, um, you know, they would engage because ultimately it is that collaboration, you know, for, uh, you know, not everybody can be resilient and not everybody necessarily takes a road to recovery. It's on people's, you know, it's how people wish to define those terms and that, as you all know. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Francesco and, and Celina. I could suppose I could just listen to the two of you exchanging views. It's been absolutely fascinating. Has anyone got any other questions or comments at this point, either for the chat box or that they want to ask directly? We've still got about 15 minutes. Nope. Um, Selena, was there anything you wanted to, to, to add um, to the amazing amount of stuff you've already shared with us? Um, um, I actually just wanted, I'm just curious, um, because obviously I'm, I'm just assuming people are from different parts of the country or different services. Mm. Um, I'm just interesting to, um, curious to know how have people found Dialogue Plus or conversations around Dialogue Plus. Uh, Simon shared some of his experiences just wondered anybody else has has the feedback been positive or is there is the feedback been some things that we need to change okay um I mean, I think quite a lot of people have joined because they actually want to find out more about it. But I can see that um has got a hand up now. So I'll I'll call Katya before um Francesco. Hi, um hi Selena. Hello again. <laughs> um I just wanted to um I thought that your presentation was really interesting. I just think as a tool, it's really interesting for advocates to think about in relation to how people have expressed preferences and whether they truly were put at the center of the conversation to do that um, and to check some of those things around options and what's been offered or, or as the as the most as the quickest option being the one that's kind of been chosen together so so I just thought from that perspective having a bit of a double check with an advocate sometimes is a might be might be really helpful um, where I have found uh, I had a conversation not so long ago with somebody on a ward a, um, uh, ward manager who said that in terms of the dialogue plus one of the things that he um, uh, finds hard about it is that in administering medication obviously there is a level of this is what we have to do this is not uh, something that you can choose or not choose not to have so <clears throat> I guess those tensions around wanting to empower but also then providing care and uh, yeah that that, that kind of negotiating that around dialogue plus he he found tricky found tricky um so the, yeah that's my feedback <laughs> but thank, thank you. you yeah thank you Katia for sharing for sharing that um yeah something's come to my mind but one of the things mainly is that it's kind of it's it feels really uplifting to hear that people are thinking about those conversations around medication um, and the fact of how to have that sort of conversation in an empowering way, because at, at one point that we were so far away from that, but to hear that people are actually thinking about that and is actually feels quite, feels quite positive. Um, so yeah, so thank you for sharing that. There's one other thing I wanted to ask was, about accessibility. So if someone uh, needed language or, or other kind of communication support, um, is there a resource in the NHS that's also been created to ensure that this is um, available equally to, to every, every patient, every person? Yeah, so there's two, so obviously every trust has their accessibility needs, so things like if somebody requires it in braille or larger prints or in a different, um, and that is made available. Um, so if, so if, if somebody has accessibility needs, then, then that needs to be addressed by the team that they're under and make the information accessible for them. 
Um, the only thing we can't change at the moment is the actual document or the care planning, the care plan on Rio, because that's a standardised form. Um, but things like the patient's information leaflet um, can be um, asked to have in different languages um, and different accessibility, different accessibility needs. Um, and hopefully when the app comes out, that would make it a lot easier because in an app you can just have um, a button to press and then there'll be a list of languages and someone can pick whichever language is theirs to actually have the whole um, dialogue plus changed into that language. Um, it also will have an immersive reader function. Um, so, yeah, so all I'm afraid our journey is still quite new. Some trusts have developed the app first and then moved on to Rio. We've actually gone with Rio first and then moving on to the app. Right, that's that, that's great. Thanks. I've got Simon's got his hand up again and I'll take Simon and Francesco and then we'll start to wind up and unless anyone else has got any other questions. So Simon. Yeah, I mean, just very quickly, I wanted to, for, for the sake of balance, so the, the initial question I asked was because it's a, a challenge that's coming up, but we, we overall, um, I, I think it's quite a demand on, on the system. I think dialogue is an excellent tool. I'm a big fan of it. I think it's got some excellent questions and I think it it's it, it potentially a better replacement than CPA, but I'm finding perhaps and this is a local problem that our bureaucracy is starting to get a bit more troublesome because it's adding more and more features to it and more and more sections. And actually it's becoming what feels like quite a painful task rather than an, a, you know, an essential tool for, for centering the, the service user voice at, you know, at, the, at the heart of everything we do. But overall, I think it's been a very applicable tool across a very broad spectrum of, of needs and conditions, diagnoses and, and complexity. Um, so just wanted to add that for balance's sake that actually, you know, overall it's been well received. And I think it's allowed us to highlight and and it's not that we wouldn't ask some questions, but I think if we've asked people, is it always oh, anything else you want to talk about rather than asking specific questions around those domains? I think that's been one of the key strengths is that it, it prompts those particular domains to say, well, what about this? Rather than waiting for people to perhaps volunteer it who may not. Um, automatically have thought, well, uh, perhaps I should be telling my key worker or therapist this. So, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it is a challenge. I think that there's a risk at the minute of it becoming new CPA because it feels like it's getting too layered. And I think it, 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 <clears throat> there's a sort of, we need to be cautious that we keep it focused on what it's really intended to do rather than becoming um, a data-driven thing for the organisations that, that use it and it does remain an essential kind of patient rated tool. So I think if there's a lot of positives to it. So yeah. I, just, I wanted to add that for balance. So thank you for that, Simon. And it's really interesting you picked up on that point that it, unlike the old CPA tool, where it didn't allow us to be curious or ask that extra question, the Dialogue Plus tool it, it opens itself up for that curiosity so that we can be curious about somebody's um, uh, answer or what somebody is trying to tell us, so that we can we can gather um, uh, more information to actually lead to support in the service user. So I think you know that has really helped with the Dialogue Plus tool. So thank you for that. Great, thanks very much, Selena. And I'm now going to hand over to Francesco to have the second to last word. And then obviously, Selena and I will have the last words. Um, OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I mean, we've, we're 13 years down the line from the Quality Act 2010. The NHS trusts have all been in place. We've got nine protected characteristics. We know roughly what the reasonable adjustments should be. Um, if English isn't your first language and you're using services as what was mentioned, you know, interpretation services, translation services should be made available in the format that's, you know, uh, able for the person using the services to engage with. What I would actually say is that although 
my mental health trust, they've been brought to a mental health trust. All they've ever known in their life is require improvement from the Care Quality Commission. Oh, shame, shame. Um, one thing that they did do was to uh, attach a piece of software onto our website called Recite Me, which basically it doesn't matter what the A to Z of languages are, or if you've got autistic spectrum disorder, or you need to increase the fonts, the color of the background, or have the document speak uh, speak its contents to you. It's there and it's available. So what I'd say to you, recite.me, and there's no reason if you know they want to pledge you know, uh, reasonable adjustment to its entire community, why they shouldn't at least have a look at the software because you can have it on trial. And I don't know about, but I'll be honest, I don't know about the cost, but our mental health trust has got it. To what extent it's used, I'll be honest, I don't know, but, you know, we've got an uh, ethnic uh, minority community in the Bristol area of about over national average. So, you know, we're there. Whereas the other areas not. The other thing I would say to you, Don, as well, is that we've got six local authorities that are co terminus with the mental health trust. A problem that we have with independent mental health advocacy, yeah, and uh, uh, mental capacity is that each contract's given to a different provider, or if there's a Section 75 agreement, it may well be that the crisis care and home treatment team will undertake that assessment, which I totally, totally, totally don't agree with, because ultimately you guys are the professionals and ensure uh, its efficacy in terms of its delivery and that. So I guess some of that would interfere, Selena, with people being able to have a voice where they don't necessarily have a voice. If those systems are not in place and not well understood. And when I step on the uh, threshold of any uh, hospital that I go into, I look up for all the po posters on the walls so that patients are aware, but they ain't got their own phones. I make sure that they got access to the nurse station phone, but it'd still be good if people turn up Donna once a week on a set day, a set time as they used to before COVID. I've yet to see that since the last of the three lockdowns, maybe the contract with the local authorities have changed, but they're in place, but they're not the same. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jessica. I mean, our, our contracts at the moment are all in the greater London area, but I would say that part of the problem for us is that advocacy contracts are desperately underfunded. I mean, we have contracts that haven't even had a cost of living rise for the last 10, 10 years. So I think, you know, we talk a lot about the staff in crisis in the NHS. There's a the money in staff in crisis and advocacy as well. And I would just say the advocacy project, we're really, really lucky with the staff we have because they always go um, above and beyond and we can not we can never provide them with the money and support that they deserve for the work they do because it absolutely changes lives. And in some cases it saves, it saves lives. And I think absolutely. it's very mis it's very undervalued within the NHS and care system so that's my plug for the work of advocates everywhere um, without whom the world would be a much much poorer place so it really just ends for me after that little advert for our services um, and for our cause um, to thank everybody for coming to especially thank Selena um, for sharing so much with us it's it's wonderful to hear a tool that actually starts by asking people what matters to them because that's the only way really that you can get to the heart of a motivated recovery for for somebody um we will be sharing the slides and powerpoint and video with anybody who's registered for the event um afterwards um so that you can show it to other people and go back over it um and really just thank you everybody and um, whatever you're doing over the break um that's coming up um whether you're working whether you're with family whether you're missing family um just to say i hope everybody has a a, a good time and a, and a restful time and, and a good new year um 2024 hopefully might be the year when a lot of things in health and social care start to turn the corner you never know so thanks very much everybody bye <laughs>